I started traveling internationally right after high school. I was lucky enough that my parents gave that to me as my graduation present. So I had a two week trip to England and Scotland and was in a very strange spot because technically it was a high school trip and I was no longer in high school. And the teachers didn't know what to do with me and they were kind of like, we'd rather you stay with people but just be safe. Uh, <laughs> so I, I did an awful lot of kind of wandering around various parts of England and Scotland, mostly with other people I'd traveled with, and an awful lot of kind of wandering around back alleyways because I'm an artist and I was really fascinated with drain spouts. Um, <laughs> so since then I have gone to Mexico, Greece, Italy, South Africa, Botswana, France, Austria, the Czech Republic, Germany, Hungary, China, and Tibet, as well as all over the US. Um, I try and do an international trip once every three to five years. Sometimes international means, you know, Mexico. That's fine. Um, just because I think it really, it, it, as per the title on the book that we had started, uh, I think it broadens your horizons. Hey, you have hopefully things that will make this possibly work. Uh, <laughs> hi everyone, this is my fiance Stuart. He's better at tech than I am. Uh, I'm going to steal my notes and he's going to steal the computer. Uh, but yeah, I've always taken travel as inspiration for my work, which doesn't always make sense to people because what I paint is primarily animals. And one of the main reasons I kind of wanted to give this talk was to talk about just because you find travel inspiring and just because it does inform your work doesn't mean that people necessarily are going to see why that is and that that's okay. Um, yes, I love traveling to Italy. Italy's amazing. I would love to go back. I love traveling to Greece. Greece is amazing. I would love to go back. You're not going to find me painting the statues that I saw there necessarily. That's not really so much my forte. I will do studies of them. I have sketches of them in my books. That's fantastic. But how it informed my art isn't necessarily a direct confluence. So I guess one of the things I was going to start with is an important thing to keep in mind when you're traveling. And my the thing that I'm always saying, you know, okay, if you're going to travel, if you've never done international travel or if you've never traveled by yourself, which I've done both of these, the most important thing that I pack is a sense of humor. Because <laughs> an awful lot of things aren't going to do what you think they're going to do. And that's true traveling internationally, that's true traveling domestically, like, everything's going to go wrong and that's going to be okay. Like, later you'll get to tell amazing stories about it <coughs> and it's all going to be fine. Um, but it's, I've done one and a half books, uh, no, I've done two books about the kind of more epic travels that I've done. One of them is Dry Season Only, which is all about the travels that we did to South Africa and Botswana. And the other one is Search for the Snow Lion, which in theory I was going to have with me, but like I said, nothing ever goes right, be it in travel or in publishing. It is somewhere on the ocean. <laughs> We hoped it would be here in time. It was supposed to be in a month ago, but between tariffs and between publishing problems, it definitely did not ship at the time that we had all hoped it would be here. So, um, we the reason that I've put these together and something that is very important with both of the titles is that they both reflect the humor of travel. Um, initially, Dry Season Only was entitled uh, Expanding Horizons, a creative sojourn. But if you look at the cover of that book, that would be RRB, stuck in the middle of the largest salt flats in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> when we got stuck there and we managed to find someone with a sat phone, they, um, I don't, you, uh, <laughs> we managed to find someone with a sat phone. Our GPS was just flashing dry season only. 
across the top. <laughs> because those roads are roads you should only use in dry season. And we were, in fact, in dry season. It was the first week of dry season. But it was a very wet, wet season. <laughs> but, uh, again, sense of humor. The, the nights that we spent in the middle of those salt flats, because there were two, we should not have spent any, um, were my favorite parts of the trip. I have never seen the stars so clearly anywhere else I've traveled. Mm -hmm. The horizons were amazing and bizarre. Um, I've also never seen horizons that blended so clearly into the ground because the salt flats are reflectively white. And so the further you get to the horizon, the more they just blend into the sky. And there were very few parts where you could actually see any transition from ground to sky which was marvelous. And it's, is it doing the thing? Yes. Oh, that's exciting. Hey, we've got slides. Uh, now let's see if we can actually make it, you know, do the rest of it. Please, tech people, don't leave me now. Uh, <laughs> how do I make it actually go to where I need it to go? Because this is not a, a, an aspect that I am familiar with. Okay. Because that's where I am. <laughs> Sorry, technology, sense of humor. <laughs> it's fine. Um, but the other thing is just like general kindness to everyone. The things that I try and do every time, and this is like super basic travel things, but it's not necessarily, if you haven't traveled internationally, maybe it doesn't like strike the, oh, this is my to-do list. My to-do list is always, can I learn how to say please, thank you, and I'm sorry. Everything else, if I can get Google, Google Translate to do it, it's fine. But I should be able to say those three things. Um, but yeah, and I try and make my trips all have ideas, not goals. Our idea behind the Tibet trip was we're looking for snow leopards. It wasn't a goal, because if that had been my goal and I didn't hit it, then there's like this sense of disappointment and perhaps like I have somehow failed. And that's not at all what it was about. It was about hey, it's looking more promising, that's my desktop. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that eventually they will get the lights sorted once they actually get the slides sorted. Um, so it's not, an, again, don't, don't set yourself up for failure, set yourself up for success. This is what we do with dog training, so let's do it with people too. Um, the, the entire point of my traveling is to be inspired and to walk new paths. So, sorry guys, I'm getting like rather distracted because there's interesting things going on behind me. Um, that's a large part of the recognition of what travel is for me. Something that a lot of people I think get distracted by is, oh my God, what camera should I bring? Like, do I need to get a fancy camera? Do I need to do like, Oh, I need to learn all of this about my camera. And I'll admit, I do have a fancy camera. I don't always take it. Uh, hey, that's exciting. We've got slides. Yay, thank you. Yeah, I think so. If I did, uh, not that. That's what I was looking for. Yay! Great success. Look at that. Look at that. Yep, that was... We were heading out of the Tibetan Autonomous Province. Can you kill the lines What you think, Denise? Is that good? You know, like, we want those lower spots. You want it? Whoa! Hey, that's why you come close. I'm not the, I'm not the light thing. I'm trying real, real hard not to throw everything off of this desk. Because that would be, like, somewhat less good. It's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not sitting, and that's fine. Um, so, this was one of my favorite photos I took, and it was from the car. Yes, with a good camera, but through a really terrible, dirty window. Does anyone care? No. Like the like the entire point of the photo. While it is like a gorgeous photo and it did come out well, if I try and print it, it's a little bit, you can tell that there was, you know, a window there, it's fine. 
Um, but it did capture a mood. It is a series of prayer flags. There's three different towers of prayer flags, and all of these stones that are stacked in the bottom here are carved in with prayers. They're carved in with mantras that people have been leaving there for generations upon generations. Um, that's the kind of art I'm known for. It's, um, they need to take a video that they do for online stuff, so I need to be lit. That's the that's the struggle we're having here. Um, and if you, you want to slide, slide are so great. Oh, yeah, we can't really see that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but again, like something that is important to me more so than the exact accuracy of what you've seen is capturing a mood. For me, this is based off hyenas. I was in Africa for two weeks, and we heard them every night. We never actually saw them which is one of the reasons I painted this. We'd see them at dusk when the shadows were getting nice and deep and they had like blue-green tinges to them and the sun was this fiery line across the horizon. So I've got all sorts of pictures of sunsets in Africa and strange shadows and everything and it's not at all what I'm painting. What I'm painting is how that mood affects how I heard them because I heard them sing every night. So that's the breath of the fire that's coming out because they start at sunset. So don't necessarily think that it's a direct translation. Again, I was talking about keeping a sense of humor. When we, that's me on a very scrubby little pony uh, with <laughs> our guide who was marvelous. Um, the first two weeks when we were in Tibet, we were in the Tibetan Autonomous Region, which the Tibetans will say is Tibet and the Chinese will say is China. And everyone kind of looks the other way and pretends that we're not having this fight. Um, and we had spoken to an agency that is the Snow Leopard Trust. Like, we were specifically working with little villages. We stayed in this man's home, and they helped us attempt to find snow leopards. And one of the things that the agency had offered as an option was, if you would like, you can talk to your guides and you can ride horses and go on like a wildlife tour from horseback. Well, we showed up, and the translator we were supposed to have was not going to be able to make it for the full two weeks we were there. And then was not going to be able to make it for the week we were there. And then was just going to be the weekend, and then didn't end up showing up at all. <laughs> and um, Google Translate is wonderful, and it will save you in many, many countries. It will not save you in Tibet. <laughs> and the Tibetan people speak very little Chinese. And there is not an app out there that will make you speak Tibetan. And there are very few books out there that will let you speak Tibetan. So there was an awful lot of mime. So eventually, like, by the day before we were supposed to leave, you know, I had pointed to this page in the little book quite a few times, and they didn't have time or they couldn't figure it out because they needed to coordinate with other people in the village who had horses that were, you know, tourist safe. And then the last day, he's like, oh, but, you know, you wanted horses, like, and this is all through mine, and we're trying to figure this out. And he's like, you can sit on this horse, and I essentially got a pony ride. Uh, <laughs> I've been riding for most of my life. This is not what I thought I was signing up for. It was fine. Um, it was all entertaining. It was a very good time. Um, other people sat on the horse and got led around. The horse was very confused. <laughs> but it's again sense of humor and just roll it with it so sense of humor like these are some of the sketches that i did that day and the following days the the tiny baby yak is wearing a tiny little um jacket because the yak was born the day we were there and it was quite cold and so he got a tiny little jacket he just bounced around with his tail straight up and you know well it was cute so talking about the camera um one of the pictures, which I didn't actually use in my slideshow, and I should have, uh, that ended up in our book was definitely taken with my cell phone. Because I didn't know where we were going that day, and I didn't feel like lugging the big camera around, so I left it in the hotel room, and ended up going to the largest pile of pile, the largest, that's not the right word, largest site of Monty Stones, um, 
being in China. So the Monty Stones are the prayer stones that were in the first photo. They're, every time they paint them, or they carve them, they carve them, and then they paint them red. And we were standing in an area where horizon to horizon was red fading to white and gray because they had been there for so long. There are millions and millions of money stones in that area. I didn't have my real camera. I took it with pictures of my cell phone. It was fine. It didn't change the experience at all. Like, and a big part of it is just like making sure that you're in the moment and you're just trying to capture an idea or a feeling to be inspired by later. Like, don't let your lack of a thousand dollar camera keep you from, like, don't, don't bemoan it, essentially. You know, it doesn't, matter that much. Yeah, I've got a tiny little point and shoot that's actually my favorite thing to take around cities because I can just slide it in a hip pocket or whatever and not worry about it. It's way nicer. A um, couple more pieces of art that were the one on your left, my right. I saw the prayer flags everywhere and I was talking about the Monty Stones. There were a few places where they actually carved prayers into skulls. Uh, and left these yak skulls piled up in areas where the Monty Stones were. And the dude on the right is a stylized version of a bearded vulture. And I was seeing stylized versions of animals everywhere where I was going. And that was a very common color palette. So use them for inspiration. Again, this is, for me, travel is about what you feel. And um, I have no idea why there is a little R in the circle there. <laughs> We're just going to roll with it. Fine. Um, <laughs> what I felt when I was in this particular um, area was a whole lot of awe. Um, what one of my friends felt was very indignant. Um, this is one of those photos that does not at all capture the experience of where you were, which is also why I say cameras are not that important. I don't care how many times you take a picture of the Grand Canyon, it's not going to be standing up. It's just not. So you take as many pictures of the little things that are important to you that are going to evoke that kind of response to you and then hope you can catch some glimpse of it or that that reminds you of it later. So for context for this photo, one of my friends was just screaming mad at this location. We were just pulled over on the side of the road. We were going from point A to point B. This is not a spot where you necessarily stop, like there was a pullover. And obviously, all of these white um, scarves are the scarves that are given to families when they're going from point A to point B. It is a good luck emblem. And they will often leave them as essentially more prayers at whatever location that they are at or at a point that is important to them. That big area that just looks like lumps looked like someone dropped a Grand Canyon at the foot of the Himalayas. It should be a wonder of the world, and we didn't even know it existed. This was literally a we're going from point A to point B kind of thing. What the heck is that? Uh, and we pulled over and we hung out for a little while, but we couldn't hang out for very long because we had a very long drive that day. But one of my friends was just hopping mad that we didn't even know it existed. You know, this is, it was a stunning vista. There were screaming winds. The Himalayas, that is the boundary between Tibet and Nepal. And just no one knew. And there, I believe that was called the God's Feet, if I'm remembering the translation God's right. God. Feet. And it looked like there were like either the bottoms of tree trunks or like feet just kind of step and sunk into the ground at various points. So every time I travel, there's different things that I make notes of, like what do I feel in different areas. A whole lot of Tibet was just loneliness and age. Like, it's a huge open space. It's the lowest elevation we were at the entire time we were there. For China was 7,000 feet, for Tibet was 11,000 feet. We were above tree line for a majority of that trip. And it was just, you were constantly alone, and then you would find hints of where civilization had been, or that people do in fact travel through here because the nomadic communities still use a lot of these areas and are incredibly active. But they're active when they're active. So the family we were staying with, for example, was a nomadic yak community. 
They were in their winter camp when we stayed with them. And in the next month or two, they were going to be moving to their summer camp. It's just a really fascinating lifestyle. Uh, whereas when I was in Africa, it was just constant worrying life. Like there was always birds and like small creatures and there's something constantly moving in the bush. And it's, everything was rusty and red and everything here was incredibly desaturated except for the sky which was sharp enough like this crazy blue that when you paint it people are like but really like maybe a little bit of something else in there you know <laughs> it, you're just high enough up it's like when you're high up in the mountains the, you have less atmosphere so it's just crisp um that was the family dog that we stayed with he was white he had a very red puffy collar around him and there's actually a practical reason for that. Um, there's an awful lot of feral dogs in Tibet because the Tibetan Mastiffs became a, such a status symbol for the Chinese around a decade ago, and they bred them to be these huge, terrible things and bred really terrible personalities. But they've always been just land-raised dogs and very practical dogs for the Tibetan people. Uh, since that trade collapsed, a lot of feral dogs have just been dumped. So they have a tendency to wear these huge red, puffy, they're made of dyed yak fur collars, which A, indicates, no, this isn't just a feral dog, this is one of our dogs. And B, they often have really thick, wide, either yak hide or often yak bones interspersed in there to prevent attack either from feral dogs or snow leopards. So they have a method of defense around their throat. So, Practical and gorgeous, which you know, attracts me. A little bit about my favorite supplies, and that's totally not what this talk is, like the point of it per se, but it's also something that always interests people. I am attached to something, there you go. Uh, this has been my favorite paint palette for I don't know how long. It's a super cheap, super cheap watercolor, Windsor and Newton, you can pull the bottom out if you haven't glued it together with gum Arabic, which I probably have. Uh, and it comes with Windsor and Newton's student grade acrylics in it. If you're a student, stick with it. If you're someone who wants your paints to last, pry those out and fill it up with something else. But it's super practical and easy. Um, a friend of mine made these lovely circular palettes, which fit into this lovely little round tin, and you can keep a lot of like tiny little things in it. I love those for travel. And I also just try and keep a brush roll, little ink pens, pencils, and these are my very lazy watercolor trick things to keep with me, which they just hold water and they have a little brush tip and I fill them before I go. And then I don't have to worry about if I'm carrying water or not. Uh, if I'm traveling somewhere and I actually feel like doing more painting, a lot of times I bring a Mr. Bottle. Uh, these are hairspray bottles that you get at like Sally's and I can use them to dampen down the watercolor palette or to dampen down my paper if I want but the reality of the situation is that's something that I take like if we're going to a weekend away kind of thing when I'm traveling the bigger trips that I do I don't necessarily want to be bogged down with stuff because then I stop living in the moment and stop like experiencing the trip that I'm doing and I get too flustered with, oh no, I need to make this thing. This thing is very important. Um, whereas if I make tiny notes and I can go back to it later, I will have a better chance of experiencing the moment and capturing it more fully when I get home. Um, this is also my travel backpack. This is what I take with me everywhere. I love it. It has uh, hip straps on it, which are currently tucked away which I highly recommend if you're going to be carrying six million things, don't kill your back, please don't. You've got enough like other random injuries you're likely to do to yourself without adding bad backpacks to it. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I take a camera of some sort, and a lot of times that's just my phone, and that's okay too. These are an example of the types of sketches that I generally do when I'm on site. They're very silly, they're very tiny, they take up like they're like two inches by two inches. Um, the one on the top right is the rock that one of our guides was like, I think there's a snow leopard up there. 
yeah. It's significantly smaller uh, or larger on screen than it was through our telescope. If there was a snow leopard up there, he has way better eyes than I do. It's <laughs> fine. Uh, <laughs> but this is an example of the things that I come home with because their ideas and their general color schemes and like very happy little dog, very happy little horse. The horse is happy until we start riding him, then he was less happy. <laughs> but very disconcerted yak. And a hoopo, which is a bird that I'd always wanted to see in real life, so that was pretty cool. And uh, Monty Stone, which I thought was just like a very cool, just just incredibly crimson stone setting on this little moss outcropping at the top of the hill. And it's just like, it was very interesting to me. So I sketched it down real fast, thinking, in the future, I want to have that memory, you know, me being me, it's probably going to have some sort of something coming out of it, be it, you know, a marmot or a mastiff or something, but that would be a large part of what is around there and a very large part of the story and the dynamic that goes into it. Packing is a thing. Um, again, with don't like kill yourself on money, that's a suitcase that I found at Goodwill. Uh, but most of the trips I take, I try not to go over two bags for Tibet since we were there for a month and I brought my good camera. I did get three, but one of them was my camera bag. So, you know, that requires a little bit extra space. Uh, I definitely try and pack so that I have one bag that is only open when I get to wherever we are sleeping, and one bag that has whatever I want that day, be it snacks, or water, or paint supplies, or sketchbooks, or whatever. That has made my life significantly easier, so I am not constantly like, oh no, I packed this one thing, and it's going to be in the back of the bus, or possibly the guide has moved it, or it went off with something else. There's the thing that's with me, and there's the thing that's not. Uh, the thing that is with me is always waterproof. And I always have a raincoat in it. <laughs> I also almost always have a scarf. My friend's scarves are marvelous. Uh, when we were stuck in the middle of the salt flats and there was no shade to be found anywhere, having a scarf to throw over your head was rather nice. You, you could be in the tent, but then you're kind of frying in a huge canvas tent in the middle of the sun. <laughs> like having a scarf to just be over you. Also, when you're painting, it's kind of nice to be able to block direct sun and then you've got light bouncing from everywhere. Um, I always pack at least two pairs of shoes. One of them is normally garbage, and one of them often ends up staying in the garbage wherever I am. But switching shoes if you're walking all day, super helpful. Um, and pack so it's easy to be creative. Um, the thing that I love about this is I have, I, have, I have sorted it in exactly the way that I know how things work. The right side is always power supplies, because I always have a battery pack in case I need things for my phone. The middle bit is always my paints and my pens. The left side is always like moist towelettes, because if I'm traveling Lord knows where, that is a nice thing to have with you. And, some, and normally actually my water bottle. And then in the bag is the sketchbook, and normally a real book, and a real coat. And I try not to put much more than that in there. Because if you start overloading yourself, you start getting distracted, and you start having all these things, and it's too heavy, and then you don't want to, and it's not fun. Make it fun. Leave it alone. So that's, that's my 10 cents at least. I'd rather not have like 6 million things hanging out and getting cluttered into my way. Um, it's the mountains that were behind the host family's house. And if I had made this too cluttered, I wouldn't have been like, oh, okay, I can just like grab this real quick because it was kind of an interesting little sketch and I just wanted to make a note of I liked the way that that horizon fell. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe not hippos. Just, just maybe not hippos. Um, uh, the hippos and the Cape Buffalo were the two most dangerous things we saw in Africa. They called the Cape Buffalo the Black Death because you don't know if they're going to decide they don't like you. They never give you any warning. They just decide they don't like you. And there are a ton, a literal ton of muscle with horns that will just flatten you. And there are no trees to climb. And the trees that are there are full of thorns. So it's all just bad. Uh, the hippos, we had asked our guide what his uh, most, let's say, unfortunate story was. 
with travelers. And he was just like, I'm not telling you until you finish this particular boat ride. <laughs> <laughs> And it had to do with hippos because hippos are terrible and they don't like people in their parts of the river and they will happily knock them over and kill them. Uh, but in regards to maybe not as a creative person traveling, maybe don't bring your fancy stuff. Like, don't bring jewelry or clothes or something that you're going to worry about wrecking. And dress very fancy because this is like my talk. This is not what I would wear if I were going places. I would take off all my jewelry. I would be wearing whatever is deemed generic in that area. Um, but also pay attention to what is deemed generic in the area you're traveling, unless you want to stand out. Um, I tend not to want to stand out. I tend to much more be comfortable trying to be a part of whatever culture I'm a part of. And there are areas where you're always going to stand out. In Tibet, I am always going to be three inches taller than most of the people. <laughs> and I do not look Tibetan. Um, but wearing kind of generic gray cargo pants, generic large coat, especially considering it was spring. People at least don't seek you out as something that's very interesting. And I find that I experience the culture a lot better in that way. This does require some amount of research. Uh, for example, in Africa, you are legally not allowed to wear camo unless you are part of the military. It's recommended you not wear red because that'll mean that the flies want to eat you. Uh, <laughs> a lot of bright colors aren't worn quite as much there because they are fly attractants, and the biting flies there are a heck of a thing. So, doing some research just to figure out what is and isn't normal in attire is always kind of helpful. You, I, I bring my smaller sketchbooks, and I bring nice quality because I like having good materials to work with, but I try not to bring things that I don't want to lose, I don't want to drop, to get eaten by a dog. Uh, I used to have a very nice paint palette that my aunt had given me that was her paint palette in college and I took it to Mexico with me and it disappeared. Lesson learned. Maybe don't bring the nice piece of palette. Maybe bring the $30 one that you got at Michael's. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> but like just doing a little bit of research and also kind of figuring out if you want to be the center of attention. If that is kind of what you want when you go somewhere and you want to just like be that magnet that attracts all the locals to talk to you, then do that. Like, wear something that perhaps all the locals aren't going to wear and be that person. I tend to be the person who wants to just kind of slide into the culture and see what happens when it just flows around me. That's done recently, but done based off of my experiences in Africa. We got to see a couple of young male lions that they, they were quite young. They did not have quite that much mane. They had the top bits, but they didn't have any of the like, long, flowy bits yet. Um, we were in Sabuti, which is the area of Africa where there are elephant-eating lions. Uh, it's the only pride that will take down elephants. And our guides had been so proud, there were two young male lions who had made it as long as anyone had known for being like, They'd grown up together and they never actually went off their separate ways and they were like, it's so cool that they've like managed to stay friends all this time. And the day before we got there, one of them killed the other one. Oh. <laughs> we were like, oh, <laughs> less of that maybe. Like apparently things hit a breaking point. Um, the other one was licking his wounds and we did not see him, but the babies were still around. Uh, again, it's not your home. So be cognizant of everyone else's cultures. Uh, do a little bit of research, be it via travel guides or online. For the more rural trips that I take for Africa and for Tibet, I, I am not the trip planner. I, I admit that I am lucky enough to have someone else who does that for me. Uh, this is a group of creatives and one of my friends actually has her travel agent's license and she deals with the locals and she talks to them all. But a lot of the things that she has sent us for resources are things such as um, I think it's Travel Planet, I think is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, has a lot of what is and isn't done in various areas. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in Tibet, you're not supposed to touch the heads of small children. It's considered extremely rude. Mm -hmm. So like little things like that to know, like where it would be natural for like a kid comes up to you, kind of ruffle their hair or something. No, don't do that. It's a terrible mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. Even if they like come up to you. 
uh, is it okay to take pictures area in different areas? Uh, when I was in Italy, that you don't take pictures in general. You just don't want to take pictures of military installations. You know, like just maybe don't do that. Like most people, not so keen on it. Uh, but a lot of times when you're in Italy, you don't necessarily know what is a military installation unless you know what their symbols are, which are like the double-headed eagle. If you see big gold double-headed eagles, it probably means you shouldn't be taking pictures of them, which I found out after I was taking pictures of them. Um, my friend was like, no. Uh, but just trying to be aware. And like I said, even when you do the research, I knew I shouldn't take pictures of military. I had missed the, you know, big dumb eagle. But again, learning to say please and thank you. If you're in doubt, ask. And if you're still in doubt because translations are terrible, just don't do it. <laughs> like, and a lot of times that's generally the safer way to do it. Uh, talking again about areas that we go to and the things that we bring out of experience, experience out of trips. The day that, the couple days before we actually left China and Tibet, it was just starting to be spring. It's technically we were there in spring. We got there. We arrived on April 10th. Um, but we were at altitude. We were in the mountains, in the Himalayas. And it was a lot of snow. There was a lot of every single day our car got stuck in the snow. That was the way of it. Uh, I, I, we're having this kind of running joke with our trip now that perhaps all of our books should be named something after where we're getting our cars stuck. But that's fine. So the days we were leaving, we're starting to see things come into bloom. We're starting to see flowers come out and buds come out and crops are starting. They're starting to unveil the greenhouses. And the entire time I was there, you know, we're looking for snow leopards and we're just essentially sitting in quiet areas in the mountains hoping. And it just felt like there should be unicorns. <laughs> the entire time, I'm just like, you know, there's, in theory, well, in actuality, there's snow leopards. We know there's snow leopards. There's three sightings of snow leopards while we were there. But it felt like we were hunting for unicorns. It felt like a mythical beast. Uh, it's also why there is the myth of Sa, which is the snow lion, which is what we have named the second book. Um, it's, it's the search for the snow lion, which are these mythical snow leopard beings, except they have huge manes of green hair, as if they were lions. So it, it was just kind of a magical place, and it, feels, it felt that way. For memories and souvenirs, I did bring some of the fun things that I brought back from Tibet, but you'll notice there's not a ton, because it's not really why I go there, in theory, like, and well, in actuality, two of the things that are on that desk are actually gifts for someone else. Uh, <laughs> but if you find things that are going to resonate with you, that are going to be important for you, A, yeah, go for it. Like, bring yourself back fun things. B, maybe do a little bit of research as to what they are and what the history of the things are first. For Tibet, for example, um, there's Tibetan singing bowls everywhere. And if you've done research into them. One of my friends is an anthropologist, and she just, the same person who was getting mad at the Kenyan, she, she gets mad about various things. Uh, she got quite mad at the Tibetan singing bowls, because they are not, in fact, Tibetan. Uh, they were developed by a company who was very good at advertising them back in the 70s, and they're made in Mexico. And now you can buy them in Tibet, because they have figured out that <laughs> dumb Americans apparently think Tibetan singing bowls are a thing. But they're totally not historically accurate. And if you love them anyway, get them, enjoy them. But, you know, it, it is a little bit funny seeing how many people were there buying Tibetan singing bowls. Um, also, when you have the opportunity to support locals, you know, if you can support locals, if you're in bazaar areas such as Tibet, kind of be aware of who you're supporting if you can. Uh, when I was in Lhasa, 60% of the shops that were on the main street were owned by Chinese. But if you go a couple streets off, you could actually support some of the local families. And whenever you're in areas where there's a little bit of controversy, I kind of I attempt to support the little guys if I can. Like when it's a big chain, you will, if you spend more than a day in a city, you will start to figure out, okay, I've seen this thing five times. This is perhaps not made locally, you know. 
Um, but the most important thing that I come back from all of these with are my journals. And in Africa, I was much better about journaling every day. Tibet did not lend myself to that. Tibet, it was like every three days or something, I would kind of do a compilation. Because it's exhausting being at 13,000 feet every day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but also just because of the nature of our trip. I'd, and just trying to keep that in mind too when you make your trip. What kind of a trip is this going to be? Is this going to be a trip where... I don't know, I'm going to Italy, okay, I know I'm going to be staying in hostels, but I'm going to have like regular running food and water, and maybe I'm going to be doing like slightly larger paintings because I can sit in a cafe or I can sit at the hostel or whatever, versus I'm going to Tibet and I'm staying in someone's shed and the uh, light comes from the stove, which means, or my headlamp, which means it doesn't. And that's okay. It's, it's just kind of taking into what kind of trip you're having and setting your creative expectations towards that. So, again, so you're not disappointed. Like, just set yourself up for success. Um, but keeping a journal has been a huge thing for me. And something else that you can do, and the entire reason why we started making these books, is so that we would have something that captured the essence of our trip later. Our book is very fancy. Uh, <laughs> We, we were a bunch of creatives and we had strong feelings about how we wanted to make our book. Uh, my mother has taken a page out of this book, as it were, and almost every time she goes on a trip, she collects her favorite hundred photos or something and uses Google Photos and makes a little hardback book and she puts it on her shelf. Yeah. And I think that's amazing. And I would like to start doing that with the, like, the little trips I go on because then you kind of have like, you know, a few notes from your journal and you throw them in a book and it's not, it took us three months to compile that and how many other pieces of art and blah, 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 blah that we did. It's just our favorite memories and snapshots of it. So if you just want to briefly pull it through, it's like, you know, I took 7,000 photos while I was there. <laughs> Not going to go through all 7,000 photos if I just want like a refresh of my trip. I'm going to go through the fact that I picked up my favorite 300 and I can put them on a slideshow same thing for like doing books you can easily do that and then you have this like really fun thing you can flip through anytime you want to like remember and that's to me that's the best souvenir that I ever get out of things this is a beard culture the Lammergeier they're one of my favorite birds in the world they're one of the only animals that can swallow whole chunks of bone and subsist on 80% of their diet is just whole chunks of bone uh, it was my vast hope that while I was there, I would get to see them, and I did. Uh, there are villages in Tibet where they actually feed them like you feed ducks. <laughs> and I would have loved to have done that, but we were not in one of those villages. I was just thankful that I got to see them at all. They're very strange, bizarre birds, and uh, I find them rather fascinating. So it was really killer to be able to see one in real life. Their wingspans are like nine feet. It's ridiculous. They're enormous. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Uh, this is my website is fairytaleswithtales.com, and I am Laura Garabedian, kind of all over the internet. If you ever have any questions about traveling or any of the supplies or whatever, please feel free to email me because I love to talk travel. And I have my Africa books with me. I don't have the Tibet books, like I said, they are somewhere on the ocean, somewhere. But what I do have are little 30% off coupons if you feel like buying anything off my Etsy store that are specifically for people who came to this talk. And that will take off the cost of shipping and take a portion off of the cost of putting a sketch in the book. So if you picked a species, I would very heavily draw something, some, draw a critter in the front of your book. Um, but I specifically made this talk relatively like shorter than the amount of time that I timed myself right because I wanted to open it up to dialogue. Would so, you put your book that's on the ocean right now available on your website? It is. It's available for pre-orders on Etsy. So yeah, if you want to order it, it's it's on the ocean. It should be here in the next two weeks, which means it will be in Minnesota in two weeks, which means it will be here in probably four. Um, because my friend who's doing the major distribution for all of our pre-orders is in Minnesota. After she finishes the initial distribution, she ships all of the rest to the rest of the contributors across the U.S. because we are all from all over. That book was done with 11 creatives 
only two of us lived in the same state, and that was me and someone else who's in Georgetown. Uh, this next book is done with seven creatives, and none of us live in the same states. So, uh, what, except for the pair who are husbands and wives, like those guys, but yeah. <laughs> Is this information on the card that we will pick up from you for this 30% off the money? Uh, it's not, but I also have business cards. So you can grab one of each. That way it's very easy. But yeah, if would do people have questions? Would you like to talk about weird travel things and creativity? Well, yes. I guess when you say we, 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 uh -huh. so that's uh, we, the group, how did this group come together or who is it? Who is it? So the, the Dry Season Only book and the Tibet book were both uh, collaborative travel projects. Um, a friend of mine had all, well, a lot of us had always wanted to go to Africa. And the entire concept behind the first book was, all right, we want to go to Africa. Not only do we want to go to Africa, we want to go to some weird parts of it. And we don't want to kind of be beholden to a normal travel group's itinerary. How many people do we have to have to book a van to ourselves? And she ended up getting her travels license, and she asked people this, the, she invited 12 people, because 12 people would fill a van, essentially. Like, that is the big RV kind of travel thing. And we, 11 of us ended up going, and that was enough. Like, you didn't necessarily need that one seat filled, it would have made it slightly cheaper. And that's what started our first big trip. All of the other, so that trip and then the China Tibet trip, I did with this group of creative people and we made books about it. Um, the dry season only book will be available at the library at some point. It is in processing. Um, I don't know if the search for saw will be or not, but you can get either of them through me. So we did, for dry season only, we flew into South Africa and then we drove to Botswana and we went north through Botswana. And the nice thing about arranging our own trip like this was that we could tell them where we wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Versus if we had gone with just a normal travel agency, we would have been A, constrained by everyone else in the group and what they wanted to see. And our group is weird. We're a bunch of artists. We're okay getting up at the crack of dawn or staying out late or going to sewage lagoons if there is a chance to see good birds. Um, <laughs> we we definitely, our, one of our guides took us to a sewage lagoon because we were asking him where the best chance to see birds was and he was like, um, sewage lagoon? And we're like, awesome, let's go. Um, and we had small children screaming at us and Ursula was like, they're screaming white people, aren't they? And our guide was like, yes, yes they are. Uh, they don't know why we're taking the tourists to the sewage lagoons. <laughs> we're like, but birds! Um, so we did not have to deal with other people being concerned by our strange love of weird birds. Uh, that also, it takes a long time for the guides to get used to, if you're someone who likes weird birds, it takes them a long time to realize that, no, really, this is just as important to you as the leopards. I was screaming about the bearded vultures almost the entire time we were in Tibet. We got to see condor, sorry, scenarius vultures flying low enough over us that they sounded metallic. Their wings, uh, the feathers of their wings are so big, it sounds like metals, like seeping through the air. Um, and we were thrilled to bits. And our guides were just mad that we had missed the snow leopard. And I was just like, that's cool. Like, this is really cool. We're all very happy right now. Uh, he, he, he didn't get it. We, we had another point where Ursula went flying out of a moving car because she was excited about a species of dipper she had never seen before, which are these tiny little birds. You can see them in the mountains here. They like bob around. And so she flies out of the car and she's like got her bins out and she's looking for it. She's making her notes in her bird book and everything. Um, but the guide who's concerned that this person just flung themselves out of a moving car is like, what's wrong with you? And she's like trying to make bird <laughs> and he thought she needed to go to the bathroom and he was like, oh, I'm a corner. <laughs> but yeah, like having a, a guide and a group that is just artists so they are less concerned about all of the weird things that you're going to do on trips like this has been very nice. But that is what started it. And I do enjoy traveling with friends who are all on the same page. Um, we. I, I tend to do it on road trips too. If I can get one of my art friends to like go with me across the country, I'm like, oh, and we can stop at Arches, and then we can stop here, and then, oh, there's a little spur over here. And, you know, it takes a 13-hour 
turns a 13 hour drive into a three day drive, <laughs> but also we get to see all sorts of cool things in the way. So, yeah. more thoughts, questions, please. Do you travel solo very much? Uh, I used to travel solo a lot. I have traveled solo less recently, but I still very much enjoy it. I, yes. So the ideas of where you might go next? Uh, we do. We're cons I think that the next one is supposed to be Borneo, but I'm not positive. Uh, there were three options thrown out, but I forget what the final verdict was. Along the lines of, I tend to roll with it. I, I'm just kind of like, I don't really care where we go. It's all going to be exciting and have a great time. And there are people who like desperately want to see one thing or the other. Again, with the concern about making a goal out of a trip, the person who had the least fun on the Africa trip was someone who had their heart set on one particular thing and just couldn't drop it. The fact that they hadn't seen that one particular thing and they were just getting progressively more sour as the trip went on. And I was like, oh friend, but there's lions and there's like, yeah, there's like six million beautiful things and you're missing them because you're sad you didn't see the one thing. Like, you may yet see them later, who knows? And it's, but um, I know that some of the group is planning Antarctica in about 10 years. That is probably not one I will do because I also know what makes me happy and sitting in a very small, very cold boat for most of the trip <laughs> is not that because that is essentially what that trip is going to compromise. It's going to be two weeks and only a few days of it will actually be landfall. Most of it will be on a research boat. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of like, oh. it's also going to cost three to five times as much as any other trip I've taken. And maybe I could go to three to five other trips instead of that. <laughs> yeah? Do you have any tips for solo travel since you were talking about that? Um, in what regard? I'm happy to... I guess money and, and safety. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> I was just like, many, but I'm not sure exactly <laughs> what you're asking. Um, for money, uh, a very large part of the reason why we tend to travel in April is because it's the cheapest. Uh, it is between seasons. It is after spring break, but before summer break. So the people who have kids aren't going, so they tend to be less child crowded. Uh, it often ends up with your car stuck in a lot of places because it is it is in spring. So there's that. But as long as you're okay rolling with that, that's fine. Um, the second cheapest month for travel is October. So I do occasionally travel in October. It's pre-holiday nonsense, and like, it's just generally a good idea. I, I once spent 48 hours going from airport to airport to airport, but it meant that my international trip to Italy was $600. <laughs> so if you have the flexibility to do that kind of thing, go for it. If you don't, I don't blame you one bit. Um, <laughs> I have found recently that I have a lot of friends who use Airbnbs and use, who use hostels. I have not done that internationally yet. The weirdest international tip that I have for saving money is using Groupon. Oh, oh it's fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. We spent two weeks traveling around Europe for probably a third of the cost that I would have been able to get it myself because we booked a Groupon deal. And that was in February, I think, um, which wasn't when I had planned on going, but they were like, hey, we have like dead cheap dates. And if you, one second, um, if you contact the travel agent, if they're like, well, it only flies out of New York, my plan was, okay, well, I'm gonna spend a day in New York and then I'll catch that flight. And I contacted the travel agent and I told them that and they're like, oh, for an extra 60 bucks, we can book you out of Denver. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Okay, so even though the Groupon deal says it only flies out of New York or LA or whatever, you can normally call them and be like, hey, can you fix this? Um, in terms of safety, I haven't done as much traveling internationally by myself. I've been kind of set on my own in various cities, but I had a home base to go back to, if that makes sense. I, um, Greece and Italy were both visiting friends who are from the States but were living there. But both times there was an awful lot of, well, we have X, Y, and Z to do. Here's a key to the house, go have fun. Um, and I treat it like any other big city in the US, which is 
even if I'm lost, I act like I know where I'm going. Like, walk like you have a purpose if you have any doubt on where, like, you are or what's going on. And perhaps you have gotten yourself into a sketchy area, which definitely happened in Tibet. I was like, I don't know where I am. This isn't a good place to not know where I am. I am walking north because I know my hotel is generally north, and I'm walking like I know where I'm going. Most people don't want to mess with you if you're, like, going with purpose. Um... And again, that is where the dressing so that you don't necessarily super stand out helps. Uh, the short hair, depending on where you are, can be a thing if they expect women to be really feminine, but a hat will help with that. If you're wearing a hat, you could be anyone. Um, I do tend to tone back everything to be as inoffensive as possible when I'm traveling. It's like lots of khaki and kind of army green and I, I fit into any crowd, it's fine. <laughs> don't pay attention to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of the other reasons why I do like having very minimal luggage, is I don't have to worry about where things are and safety and everything. I have, I do generally try and, I guess, expect the best out of people, um, but I also prepare for the worst. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know if that's helpful at all. No, that's very good. Okay. Oh, pockets. Pockets are your friends. And I know that, like, like, Women's clothing are terrible, but this is my very favorite thing to wear when I am traveling in a major city because my purse will not get lost. My purse will not get cut. It will not go off without me. Um, it's amazing. I have a slightly less fancy looking one that I wore to Tibet and that I will wear in Africa that's just black cloth that I can also put a metal belt or chain through if I want. Um, again, so nothing's going to walk off. I'm not going to lose it and no one's going to grab it. That's huge for me because I have traveled with a lot of people who have gotten bags stolen. And um, unfortunately, the, the passport pouch kind of thing, it will work. But if people know what to look for, it kind of flags you immediately as a traveler. And then they kind of watch you a little bit more. Whereas this just makes me look like a weirdo. Uh, <laughs> and I could be a weirdo from anywhere. So uh, it's, I, I think, a little bit more innocuous than necessarily the passport pouches. Um, having an RFID bag for your passport is always a good idea. Um, unless it's like super protected by something that's heavy duty just so that people can't scan it. But that's the same with anything else. Um, it's also making sure you flag all your credit cards and everything so they know where you're going. You had a question. I wanted to add to what you said about the blue bar. Our own, I've used it twice for international travel, and the bonus that I did not expect is that it wouldn't be on blue bar if it were high season and lots of people were filling those spaces. Yeah. So on both tours, we found that we were almost the only people for like an eight or ten person. Yeah. And that was a huge bonus. Yeah, that is huge. Um, the thing that was hilarious about us going to Prague, um, sorry, again, through Groupon, but we got to our hotel in Prague, and we checked in, and it was very quiet. It was this beautiful Art Nouveau hotel, and we're just like, whoa, because all the other hotels we had stayed in through this Groupon were kind of, they looked like a Holiday Inn. You know, they were huge and square and very obviously boxed in, and it was fine. But this was stunning. And we go to check in, and she's like, make sure that it's us. And we say yes. And she's like, OK, when do you want to have breakfast? And we're like, I don't know. Like, when do you normally serve breakfast? She's like, no, you don't understand. You're our first guests of the season, and there's no one else here. I'm going home. When do you want breakfast? <laughs> and I was like, oh, OK. So she just left and left us with the keys to the front door of the hotel. And we just had this huge, beautiful <laughs> hotel to ourselves for three days. And we're like, well, that's cool. <laughs> Groupons are fun. You end up in all sorts of weird places that you didn't necessarily expect. And like some of them will be boxy holiday inn affairs and some of them will be random art nouveau beautiful things. Any more questions? Yes. So what advice would you give to someone who would love to start an art journal but feel they are not artistic or creative? Mm -hmm. And they can still get stuck because they feel they can't draw? Oh for sure. For sure. So what is so, I, it took me a lot of bravery to show you my sketches, by the way, because I think most of my sketches are not worth showing. Oh, no. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, I have friends whose sketchbooks are these tiny immaculate works of art, and it kind of makes me scream and want to throw rocks. Um, and I always am just like, ah, but why? Um, I think that one of the things that helps me with sketches is sometimes I'll even scribble first, and I won't even, like, it's literally this. And I'm like, okay, now it's not a white page anymore. Like, and now I can make little notes over here, and this part of the scribble, scribble kind of looks like a cat, and the rest of it's bad. We're just, like, I, I generally try and be a very eco-conscious person, and I try very, very hard not to waste paper, except for sketchbooks. Sketchbooks are where I'm allowed to waste paper. Because if I think of each piece of paper as precious, I will never ever draw on it, ever. Because it's like this horrifying white sheet of paper that's incredibly intimidating and I hate it. So uh, it's also, you will notice on any of my paintings, none of them have white backgrounds. <laughs> because I hate it. Um, I start all of my oil paintings with an abstract on, of acrylic and I scribble something down first. And then I can paint on it, because then it's not white. Um, it has helped me too to buy tan sketchbooks, because it's not white. I don't know what it is about that huge white expanse of paper, but it's the most awful intimidating thing in the world. Uh, I also don't draw on the first page of any of my sketchbooks, <laughs> because it's too intimidating. I'm just like, no, like that is what's going to like define my sketchbook for the rest of eternity I had. <laughs> but if I start on the second page, that's fine. So, and if I really like what I draw on the second page, I can tear out the first page. <laughs> So, I, I highly recommend just, rec and, and also, I, I did bring sketchbooks, you are welcome to look at them. I didn't, like, curate them first, so I don't know what's in there. Uh, if, if things are real bad, I just tear them out, but sometimes I haven't looked at them for a while, so I'm not actually sure what's in them. Um, if it makes you feel better not to show anyone ever, then don't show anyone your sketchbook and don't let them give you grief about it. Someone was trying to give one of my friends grief because we were all kind of passing around sketchbooks at the last convention I was at. And, you know, they're like, well, you, you need to give us your sketchbook. And she was like, no, like, I'm not comfortable with that. And someone's like, well, we all showed you ours. And I'm like, nope, nope, nope. Like, sketchbook consent is a thing. Like, you do not get to, like, take someone else's sketchbook away. That is, this, she might have personal notes. She might have things she doesn't want to share with anyone. Like, you are allowed to say, no, that is my personal sketchbook. No one else will ever see this. There is no reason for the like, shame to enter a piece of that. That is that is just you working out what you need to work out. So just yeah. <laughs> Does that help? Awesome. Uh, yeah. You mentioned the conscious. Yes. Conscious. And um, when I travel, I'm, I now have uh, some mixed feelings about carbon footprint. Right. So Wait, do you have any comments on that? What's your philosophy or? How do you think about it? So I recognize that travel is a large part of the carbon footprint that I generate. Um, and I do try and offset that as much as I can with just trying to be eco-conscious in other areas of my life. Uh, if you have the financial means, there are places that you can be like, I'm flying from here to here, what's the carbon offset? And you can donate that to tree farms, which is kind of nice. Um, there's like apps online and I forget what they're called, but you can actually do that. Um, one of the things that I have noticed that is helping with my sketching anxiety also, and I meant to bring this up, um, I'm using an iPad to sketch a lot of times, um, and then I'm wasting less trees, and I'm also wasting just like, there, there's a lot less, oh no, I have put down this line, it must be perfect, and I'm just kind of like, well, I put down this line, but it's a computer. It's fine. Erase, erase, erase. So that has been another thing. Um, I do always try and bring my water bottle. I try and, unfortunately with travel, a lot of times I do bring a lot of prepackaged snacks, which I try and avoid if I can. But for traveling, I, I make a lot of sacrifices that I wouldn't necessarily make here. Um, for traveling through China and Tibet, one of the things that we did wasn't as directly carbon, it wasn't carbon based, but it was just environmentally based. We did try and look with companies that were strictly local. So we weren't dragging people from all areas of China. China is very large. Um, <laughs> so like we weren't dragging people from one end of the continent to the other, essentially trying to go from point A to point B. Uh, it is by its very nature, a more difficult thing to do. A lot of the lodges we stayed at with Africa did 
were more self-sustaining and they had areas that they produced their own food and things like that. So that was a very nice thing to be able to do. Yes? I just want to comment on that one of the like, carbon footprint as you travel. Um, my mom and I, she retired last year. We've been doing a lot of traveling together. Um, so I looked at the carbon calculators and I found that um, it's, my carbon footprint is about 50% travel. Um, but looking at offsets, offsets are actually incredibly affordable. All of our travel for the last year was like $100 to offset or something. I think the company was Caritas. They're very well vetted um, for Thank you. actually the money going to good places. And for each trip, like a uh, say like a trip to Europe or something, I don't know how much it is, maybe it would be like $15 or $20 to offset. Like it's ridiculously cheap to, to do that. Um, and we, I think it's called Terrapass, I can't remember, this is about a year ago, yeah. T-E-R-R-A-P-A-S-S, I believe. Thank you. Um, so we've offset at all of our travel, all of our car travel for road trips, and also all of our heating needs as well, because it's just, it's, it's, it's an easy thing to do. And then for us as well, when we travel, we try to, um, just knowing that the flight or the driving or whatever is the biggest part of it, can we increase our time there? You know, instead of going somewhere for a short amount of time, can we stay longer? Yeah. That is definitely something that I try and take into account too. The longer the trip, the more time I try and budget, um, both for carbon offset and just for, I think, trip experience. I think that you get more out of it when you're not spending half the jet lag. Um, I think the combination is good. Also, the recognition that this might be literally a once in a lifetime thing. So enjoy it, like see if you can, it's also why I try and do the trips or every few years kind of versus, I mean, if I pushed myself, I might be able to afford to do them more often, but make them these like valuable gems and try and kind of mine as much good experiences out of it as you can and out of the memories. And I mean, I have, I said 7,000 photos from China and Tibet. It's excessive. Um, and I'm going to be using them for ages. I went to Africa four years ago and I'm still finding gems out of the photos and finding gems out of the notes and everything. Like, don't, I guess, think of it as a limited time experience. Like, keep going back to it. And you're, especially if you take some notes at the end of the day or whatever each day, you'll find things more and you'll remember, like, I was going through them the other day looking at birds and yeah, there were four hornbills at one of the camps we were at and we named them John Paul George and Ringo. Uh, and I was like, oh yeah, Ringo was an idiot and he kept like hanging upside down from this tree. Like why haven't I painted like any hornbills hanging upside down yet? So it, it's it's worth and valuable going back through and, and that is why I do really like Google Photos or Snapfish or whatever, like just the cheap little books, just so you can like have those as a memento because it, it makes it easier for you to go through and, and I'm all about trying to make things easy because I am someone who likes to make my entire life way too complicated. So <laughs> anytime I can distill these down, anytime I like I have gotten my packing situation into like a thing, anytime I can make a process easier and more fun to do, that's what I'm trying to do. Because I think like you a few of you have mentioned, like travel is this big complicated thing and I think in a lot of ways it doesn't need to be. I, it just, it's really intimidating to take that first step, I think, is the biggest thing. Any more? If not, anyone who wants to come up and get any coupons or look at books or talk to me about things one-on-one, -on -one, please feel free. Um, but I'll be here for a little while, so. Thank you.